you are welcome to this brief introduction to the book of Acts, chapter 3, verses 12 through 26. We are the 8th of January, 2022. Let's get into it. We are on the second of the seven main parts of the book, the Apostles' Witness in Jerusalem and Judea, and subpart B, the Church in Jerusalem expands, and sub-subpart 1, Peter preaches the gospel in the temple. The book of Acts, chapter 3, verses 12 through 26, remain of historical interest, for it reflects the earliest known Jewish-Christian Christology, especially that of Jesus' apostle Peter. Although the author, the physician Luke, was a companion of the Apostle Paul, missionary theologian to Gentiles, he spent several months in Judea interviewing Jesus' apostles, including Peter, while Paul remained incarcerated at Caesarea between the years 57 and 60 CE. Thus the main points of the Apostle Peter's public message to Jewish pilgrims in Jerusalem proclaim it in the year 33 CE, can be reliably recovered from Acts chapter 3, which was published in Greek sometime after about the year 62 of the Common Era. Peter's discourse, or sermon, can be divided into three parts. First, how the name of Jesus healed a lame beggar which Peter's hearers saw to be true. Secondly, how Jesus fulfilled promises that God had made through the Hebrew prophets. And thirdly, how God will bless Israelites who repent by turning away from their sins of disbelief. Acts chapters 3, 12 through 26 explicitly mentions no fewer than 12 names titles and descriptors applied to Jesus. No fewer than 14 events associated with Jesus, past, present, and future, and no fewer than three citations from the Hebrew prophets that some Jews regarded as messianic prophecies, besides allusions to several other passages. Peter's discourse opens and closes with reference to Jesus as God's servant in verses 13 and 26. The Greek term used for servant in these verses is pais, apparently referring to the Greek version of Isaiah 52, verse 13, which speaks of a servant who would one day suffer on behalf of many nations. If you lead a Bible study group, then ask the learners to find all the names, titles, and descriptors used of Jesus in verses 12 through 26. Peter's discourse refers to recent events, including Jesus' death and resurrection in verse 15. He then calls the hearers to repent in verse 19, citing promises of future blessing for those who do so. If you lead a Bible study group, then have the participants identify all those events, past and future, making a list of them. In verse 22, Peter cites from the book of Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 and 18, identifying Jesus as the prophet like Moses who had predicted he would come some day. The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your countrymen. To him you shall listen. Several religions try to make Deuteronomy 18.15 a prediction of their own founding prophet. In your Bible study group, discuss reasons for which those religions are wrong on this point. In verse 23, Peter quotes, and it will be that everyone who does not listen to that prophet will be utterly rooted out of the people. In your Bible study group, discuss reasons for which this verse should apply to faith in Jesus. 
In verse 25, Peter cites from the book of Genesis, 22 verse 18, In your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. In your Bible study group, discuss ways in which this promise was fulfilled by Jesus and is still being fulfilled to this day. Let us make a few comments about these verses. First, the setting is Solomon's portico. The eastern wall of the temple grounds had a covered colonnade where worshippers could gather. This is where the apostles would teach seekers and believers every day. Verse 13. Some of the oldest Greek manuscripts repeat the phrase, the God of, before Isaac and before Jacob. Bible translators who retain these repeated phrases must avoid implying that there be three or four gods. The terms servant and glorified would be understood by Peter's hearers to refer to Isaiah 52 verse 13, where they occur together. Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. The term servant and exalted are identical in the Greek Bible to those used by Peter in the New Testament. Verse 14, the phrase, the Holy and Righteous One, clearly refers to a same individual because of its grammar, whereby a single definite article occurs before two nouns connected by a conjunction. In verse 15, the word translated raised up sometimes means to appoint or to empower someone, and other times it is used of God raising Jesus from death. Either meaning makes good sense in this verse. In verse 16, by repeating the term name, Peter draws attention to it. The name was an expression commonly used by Jews when referring to the God of Israel. Later, in 417, Jewish authorities will ask Peter, By what power or in what name have you done this? The term for faith sometimes means faithfulness. In this verse, it can mean the faithfulness of the name a title of Jesus, to fulfill his promises, hence the following phrases, his name has made this man strong, and the faith or faithfulness that comes through him has made him well. Whether you take the verse to mean the apostles' faith in Jesus, or to mean Jesus' faithfulness to God, both remain true. In any case, it was not the lame man's faith that secured his healing. Verse 18 reads, That which God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. The Greek term for all, that is, all of the prophets, often means taken together rather than each one separately. So Peter will cite from two or three of those prophets. Verse 19, the two imperative verbs, repent therefore and turn again, form a hendiades, that is, two Greek words for a single action, which could be translated, repent by turning. Both words are used in the Greek Septuagint for repentance, returning to faith in the God of Israel, and in the New Testament for turning to the Lord Jesus. Verse 20. Some ancient manuscripts read, Jesus the Christ, recognizing that Jesus defines who the Messiah is. Others invert this to Jesus Christ. Verse 22. Deuteronomy 18, 18 through 19, appears in Dead Sea Manuscript 4Q175, dated from the 2nd century before the Common Era, which contains five biblical quotations about a future Messiah or teacher 
reflecting beliefs held by some Jews of the Second Temple era, the era in which Peter preaches his gospel. Verse 25. The Greek term for sons, huioi, usually implies rights of inheritance. Here it is used in parallel with the term seed, a Hebrew idiom for descendants. 26. The Greek term for servant can be translated child or son in different contexts. Whether you translate it God's servant or God's son, it remains the same Jesus who uniquely fulfills God's promises made to Israel and to the Gentile nations. Now, I do not recommend trying to explain these linguistic observations to others unless they are able to understand them and would find them helpful. Now, may the Holy Spirit of Messiah Jesus fill you with joy and with spiritual understanding as you teach others, leading them into loving obedience to Him.